It's my distinct pleasure to have William Grossman, MIT class of 1969, for an interview today. It's May 3rd, 2003. Thank you very much, Bill, for, for coming. Um, Thank you for the, asking me. <laughs> and the, uh, one of the reasons for this interview is that this is the 40th anniversary of the MIT um, jazz program, and there's a re reunion and concert tonight. Um, Bill played both piano and French horn with the Festival Jazz Ensemble. Um, so, what was your MIT degree in? Uh, it was a bachelor's and a master's in computer science, which was a uh, sub-specialty in course six, okay. double E. And tell me briefly, we'll get into it um, more at the end of the interview, about your current occupation right now. Currently, I'm a freelance musician living in Kew Gardens, New York, just outside Manhattan. Uh, among the things I have done is I was an assistant conductor for a number of years with the show Cats in New York for about the last 14 years of its run. Uh, I've done a lot of work as a Broadway pianist and or assistant conductor. Uh, I worked with the show Sugar Babies for about two years as a pianist and assistant conductor. I was an alternate pianist with a show called Side by Side by Sondheim. I was an assistant conductor and keyboard player for a West Coast tour of Pacific Overtures by Sondheim. And prior to that, I had done some rehearsals for that show in New York while it was running. Uh, I did some rehearsal piano prior to the opening of the original production of Sweeney Todd that I was very proud of. And among my assignments for that show was, uh, I, I'll name drop, I got to coach Angela <laughs> Lansbury, and she gave me a little credit once in the newspaper. I coached her and, and sat and helped her learn her music for all of her musical numbers in the show uh, in a number of sessions. Um, let's see, what else? I also... Uh, have done some uh, music preparation, meaning I do scores and parts for composers on a uh, computer. Uh, one of the projects I did, which was a number of years ago, uh, I offered to do a piece for the MIT band, and I think they subsequently paid me because uh, it was a lot, a lot of work, but it started out sort of labor of love, and they were nice enough to give me some money. Uh, I said to John something like, what would be a project that uh, you could use some music for that you don't have music for. And it turns out they did not have a really proper score for Gregory Tucker's piece called Prelude and Allegro. Uh, it's also called Centennial Overture. I got some materials from Special Collections, which is right down the hall here. So I worked from a set of parts. Uh, I recreated a score and then uh, sort of edited the score to make all the writing consistent. For some reason, the dynamics the articulations, the slurs, didn't seem to agree up and down the score, and there was no reason that they shouldn't agree. So John and I worked for a little while and got them to the point where they were, you know, it was a sort of good-looking editorial piece of work rather than just leaving all this inconsistent stuff on the page. And they put, they made a recording, put it in the can. I don't think it's been released yet, but uh, John invited me to come up and guest conduct it. Fantastic. One um, let me see your question. So that's sort of what I'm up to in New York. I also play piano for some conducting workshops. Uh, workshops for conductors typically begin with sessions for piano and five string players. The five strings kind of stand in for the full string section, and I play what I can of the winds, brass, and percussion, which I've been <laughs> doing for a while, for groups mainly the American Symphony Orchestra League, also occasionally the Conductors Guild, and some other organizations that aren't related to either of those. One called the Conductor's Retreat in Maine for two summers, and uh, lately I've been doing something called the California Conducting Workshop, which is, these are all a weekend long usually. So that sort of describes most, if I can think of anything else, I'll yeah. let you know. <laughs> that's, that's great. There's um, many questions I'll have. And by the way, you may notice the French horn has been conspicuously put away, although I did play it for one job <laughs> Uh, I did a summer stock tour of Shenandoah. John Raitt was the star in 1976, and I played piano and French horn in that production. And also, one of the broad, one of the off-Broadway shows I did, 
I had the pleasure and still do to work for Harvey Schmidt, the composer of the Fantastics, and I Do, I Do in Celebration and 110 in the Shade. They had a theater in the late 60s and mid 70s called Portfolio Theater. It was an early example of a theater doing workshops and non-commercial work. And in one show I played p percussion and French horn. Another show I played a little bit of trumpet and piano. Uh, they never really found anybody who could play percussion and French horn. <laughs> and I sort of was a little bit of a jack of all trades and not quite the master of any one of them. My piano playing is my, my best skill that I you know do professionally and conducting, mostly for musical theater. All right. Um, so, um, kind of turning the, the clock back a little bit, um, tell me where you were born and where you grew up. Uh, let's see, I was born December 5th, 1947. I uh, grew up in Long Island, a town called Roslyn, New York. And um, um, tell me about your, your family. There are musicians in the family, and how many siblings you have? Uh, I have two younger brothers. My father was a very good amateur pianist. He doesn't play as much as he used to. Now, a little bit of arthritis, unfortunately. Uh, my mom, I think, was a little bit of a pianist, but I mostly recall my dad uh, playing a lot of piano. Where I first started to learn piano, he had forehand versions of the Beethoven symphonies that he got during World War II from Leipzig. I think he served in Europe during the war. And he brought these uh, uh, publications back. And it's one piano, four hands. So I would sit at the bottom of the piano, and he would sit at the top. And um, we'd get through these symphonies. It later held me in good stead, because I ended up getting a job, because I knew the symphony forehand parts really well. And someone gave me a job, because I sat in and played them really well once. So my father was a strong influence, and my whole family was brought up that culture should be an important part of our lives. And since we lived close to New York, we took advantage of the opportunity to see shows, uh, musicals, that I mean, uh, Saturday matinees, I sort of remember, uh, going to the New York Philharmonic, some of the young people's concerts. Um, I didn't get a taste for chamber music until years later. My father wasn't into it uh, that much, but I, I do like it a lot, string quartets and that sort of thing. Uh, heard piano recitals. I remember when I was a kid, I heard Arthur Rubinstein at Carnegie Hall. My father used to take me there. He played every Valentine's Day. Um, so some pretty major important stuff. I mean, it's uh, it was a great uh, asset to be living near New York with a sort of comfortable uh, family, you know, comfortably off financially and taking advantage of the culture of New York. Nothing quite like it, as I'm sure you would agree. Sorry. Although Boston's not bad at all. Yeah. Fantastic. Tell me about some of your earliest musical memories. Well, there's the playing four hands with my father. Um, just generic memories. I, I, I was assigned to play musical instruments. I actually remember, I think in like fifth or sixth grade, I got thrown, I got kicked out of percussion class because I, I didn't play a double flam or a 16 stroke roll and I took up the trumpet stuck with the trumpet for a while. They needed French horns in high school or junior high, and I, I switched to the mellophone, which is like this sort of bastard French horn yeah. instrument. Easier to play. The overtones are down an octave. French horn, the lip has to find overtones that are all spaced together, closer than on the trumpet, of course. Uh, French horn. And I kept playing. I didn't do much musical theater work as a player in high school. Actually, when I got to MIT was when I really started uh, spending a lot of time playing piano for musicals in Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, uh, let me think, earlier than that, I don't know, of no consequence, particularly to MIT, but I did happen to meet Edgar Varese when I was a kid. No kidding. Yeah, I, got, I knew where he lived. He lived on Sullivan Street. There's still a plaque there. And at that time, it was a kind where gentler in New York. I think it was 1965, which is the year he died. And I just walked in rang the front doorbell and he let me in for a few minutes. I just remember asking him a few questions. I, you know, it's one of these things you meet some idol and, you know, having met him, I'm not quite sure what to ask him. Oh, I, I went to Interlochen. I remember Interlochen in the summer of 64, uh, 64 and 65. And it must have been at Interlochen in 64 that I got my first taste of Edgar Varese. 
because there was this old album Robert Kraft conducted the Columbia Symphony Freelance yeah. Players and uh, I, I fell in love with that Verez music. I'd never heard I anything too. like it yeah. in my life. Yeah. I later came to realize that it was not a particularly accurately played recording. That was before people played that music with great respect and care. It was kind of thrown together. I have a feeling it was free, you know, there were missed notes and kind of not not a good caring sound. I mean, there were nowhere near the profusion of contemporary, knowledgeable contemporary music players in New York that there are now. Um, so the, the recording has a rough edge. And I seem to remember that, that I, I remember vaguely asking Varez, says, so did you like Robert Kraft? He says, oh, I didn't like Robert Kraft so much. And I'm guessing that maybe, maybe he didn't like, I didn't ask him why, or, but maybe he didn't like Robert Kraft because the recordings weren't too, weren't really all they should have been. Now you get much better recordings, so I have no doubt. Um, so what else? I met Harvey Schmidt when I was young to ask him for the music for the Fantastics, which I'd heard on the record, and he gave me a photocopy back then at cost. Very nice. We've stayed professionally. Now I work for him. I do a lot of his music preparation. Fantastic. Yeah. So when you first heard um, Edgar Varese, was that, um, was that, I mean, that's obviously a lot different than some of the music that you were describing that you'd heard growing up. How did that, how did that, um, Mr. Rudy, I mean, was that a real, something really different for you, or had you heard other... Um... Well, yeah, I, I, I understand your question. It was pretty different. Uh, my ears were already a little bit opened up. At Interlaken, there was a lot of music going on, and there were some people, the name escapes me, but there were one or two people who were specializing in contemporary music. And I remember there were little recordings floating around of Zeitmas, by Karlheinz Stockhausen, uh, and I was as interested in the way the score looked as the way the music sounded. Um, I mean, the score looked unbelievably challenging. I, 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 as I recall, it's still a challenging piece. Incredible extremes of speed and dynamics. Um, and there were people, Contrapunkt, I think, some Stockhausen piece. Forgive yeah. me, I'm not a modern music scholar okay. and not a I'm not a full-blown devotee I, I like the stuff I like and I don't like the stuff I don't like yeah uh, some people are more righteous about it you know modern music yes yes <laughs> I, I, I can't I can't go there it's not not me yeah. I make my judgments as they come but uh, um, so sometime in that summer there was this place to listen to LPs and somebody who was more into modern music at the time than I was, more knowledgeable, I should say. I didn't have anything against modern music, just hadn't heard much of it. Just said, here's this Verez record, and I thought, wow, this was great. It had tremendous energy. I think it started off with ionization. I mean, there was uh, Density 21.5. It's a well-known LP, probably got transferred to CD by now. And uh, I remember I enjoyed following the score. Oh, I also remember in high school, they needed ringers for the Hofstra Symphony Orchestra. It was a college orchestra. And Ellie Sigmeister, the late Ellie Sigmeister, wonderful American composer and spirit and forward-thinking person and champion of uh, American composers as a cause, he conducted the Hofstra Symphony. And I, I played under him, played his own third symphony, played integral, played percussion in integral, and a couple That's other right, things. right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh, late years later, when I was at MIT, John Corley let me guest conduct for the band, and one of the pieces I got to do was ionization no on tour. Can you imagine taking all those instruments on tour? Wow, <laughs> that's great. Anyway, I'm rambling a little, but no, um, this is good. Yeah, that's good. Um, so we'll get back to some of the um, some of this this train of thought, but I want to get back to um, the the subject of of, of jazz. Um, did you grow up listening to much jazz? Well, no, not really. We lived near the Westbury Music Fair, which was a venue for booking uh, different acts, sometimes shows. I think it's probably like the, if it still exists, the Cape Cod Melody Tent or the North Shore Music Theater. It was, you know, popular entertainment for audiences in Long Island and an alternative to going into New York City for the night. And I remember hearing Dave Brubeck there. And at the time, I thought Dave Brubeck was, that was it. I was 
pretty ignorant, and I'm still not real well versed. I mean, a lot of people I know in New York know much more about jazz than I do, much more knowledgeable. Um, and actually, I remember this is related to MIT very specifically. I lived in senior house, and my sophomore year, I think it was the Holman wing. It's all been changed now, but there were six wings back then. And I was a roommate of a young guy named Larry Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. I don't know whatever happened to him. He may have dropped out of MIT and not finished for all I know. And he knew avant-garde jazz. He was schooled in it. He knew the Blue Note albums, Ornette Coleman, uh, John Coltrane. He was listening to things. Senior House was a pretty kind of Dave Brubeck, white bread kind of jazz-oriented bunch of students. And this poor guy was getting put down for listening to these records. Bunch of, I mean, he was right and they were wrong as far as I'm concerned. He knew exactly what was happening. And he turned me on to some of these records. I remember he used to put down Dave Brubeck. Um, he would say, because Dave Brubeck's, you know, it was like a big thing that Dave Brubeck played in 9-8 and in 5-4. And they would call time out, time further out. And he would say, oh, you know, what is with this Dave Brubeck? How's your time? What's the time? Give me the time. Uh, he was very outspoken. Uh, and it was, it was very courageous because, you know, Senior House, uh, the average sort of musical layman at Senior House could be pretty insistent on their standards. You know, I like Dave Brubeck. And who are you to tell me that Dave Brubeck is no good? Anyway, under this guy's auspices, I heard a lot of jazz, his LPs, a lot of... Uh, the Blue Note, I think the, the, the Winter album with Ornette Coleman and David Azenzen, and I forget the names. And I remember this guy was in heaven because in 1967, John Coltrane played in Kresge Auditorium. I remember he played one uninterrupted 90-minute set. That was, the, that was the performance. He was just there, played whatever he played for 90 minutes. Wow. And uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting that MIT got him. I think that may have been the last year of his life. I don't know my statistics. So me and jazz. Um, I once heard the Thad Jones Mel Lewis band during my college years when it was the original incarnation of the Village Vanguard with the original generation of players. It's still a great band now, but back then it was legendary. Um, but I didn't really... And I was in a stage band in high school that played these stock arrangements. Uh, you know, Later on I found out how really... Uh, unadventurous they were things like it would have written out solos you know you know jazz by the numbers or you know kind of jazz with a helping hand like babysitting the players um, and uh, I don't know leading up to the MIT jazz band I can't remember quite how I got involved I guess I was a pianist who thought he could play a little bit of jazz and uh, and I ended up being involved with the jazz band here at some point so we'll get to that. I um, want to backtrack just a little bit. Tell me about um, some of your training, musical training before you got to MIT. Well, it was it was not. Uh, 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 I don't know, how can I put it? It wasn't by the book. I didn't take a lot of mm -hmm. formal classes. I learned a lot from my father. Uh, I remember I would also I was in the habit of listening to records before I ever saw the music. And then with excitement, I would go to the New York Public Library and look at the music to see how the music looked in relationship to what I heard. And sometimes I, was, I would be surprised. You know, the downbeat wasn't where I thought it would be and stuff like that. The notation would surprise me. I remember for years I heard the Rite of Spring, which of course is famous for, among other things, the dance sacral at the end where almost every measure, the time signature changes. And, uh, and some measures, the time signature... Uh, is a conceit on Stravinsky's part because you don't hear the downbeats, ba 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 the empty downbeats, yeah. downbeats with no yeah. music, and people probably analyzed it: is it a downbeat or not, and so on. But anyway, so I heard the music and finally saw it. It was very exciting. I can't, don't know what the analogy was, but um, and I learned to read scores. Then the first score I ever learned the mechanics of reading a score with you know reading left to right and two systems on a page. Uh, my parents, I think, bought me Billy the Kid's Suite by Aaron Copeland, still near and dear to my heart, that score. Um, I somehow absorbed it, somehow absorbed all this stuff, learning to read, learning to be interested. It started with an interest in the pieces. I, I heard music I liked and 
wanted to find out more about the music. And my formal, my ears were good. My formalization of theory knowledge was not great. I mean, I couldn't give chords the right names, but I sort of knew what they were. I remember going to camp, uh, summer camp. I was in about 10th grade, and I discovered by accident that I had perfect pitch. <laughs> I remember somehow I was in a dine, an empty dining room that had a piano in it, and I said to some kids, said, play, play a note, and I turned my back and walked away. I said, like, you know, whatever, is that an F? And one summer I discovered I had perfect pitch. Um, so it was sort of a little bit accidental and unstructured, some of the learning. I still have gaps. Um, let me think. But, but I, I, kind of, I kind of sought it after for proportionate to the amount of pleasure I got. Uh, I, I haven't studied string quartet scores as much as I've studied orchestra scores. And I, I think most of my interest originally was with orchestral music. I know some piano music, but not nearly any large portion of the repertoire. But I've, I've been through a lot of orchestra music. You know, you put a page of a Beethoven symphony up in front of me, and I could probably tell you what piece it's from, that kind of thing. I can recognize the music. I took piano lessons also when I was a kid. Uh -huh. What uh, led you to come to MIT? <laughs> Well, I was a math and science whiz, and that's where my parents thought I should end up. I had a friend who was a few years older than me named Barry Skeist, S-K-E-I-S-T. I think he was a senior when I was a freshman, so maybe he was in the class of 66, maybe. And he lived near me. And um, in the kind of school atmosphere I went, with, went to, it was very achievement-oriented, and you were supposed to go to the best school you could. You weren't just supposed to go to some half-assed school. You are supposed to get into the best school you could get into. And I think at one point I had dreams of getting into Harvard. I was steered away from that at some point for whatever reason. <coughs> and I was very good in math and science in high school. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it seemed like a sort of natural place to uh, set my sights on. Did you know about the music program at MIT before you came here? Uh, only in very bare terms. I think I have a vague recollection before I went to MIT that my parents had gotten wind of a concert, a town hall that the MIT concert band was doing one night. Um, I don't think I knew much about music at MIT. I, I probably, I mean, I don't think I assumed that there was no music, I just didn't know anything about it. With your uh, enthusiasm for music you know, prior to, to college, um, had you given much thought what you might want to do in college? I mean, it's... You mean musically? Yeah. Uh, no. No. Mm -hmm. I gave it a lot of thought the first week I came here, which yeah. I'm sure we'll get to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so in some ways, the, the, the um, music program here probably came as a pleasant surprise. Yes, and uh, I would add the, the adjective, the extracurricular music program. Pretty much all the activities were not for credit, uh, extracurricular. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was the courses such as they were, but the music that I immersed myself in was the, with the groups, the, the performing groups, mm -hmm. all extracurricular. Later on, for credit, a few of them. So, did you? When did you first start playing under Herb Pomeroy? Was that your freshman year? I'm a little shaky on the dates. I have a feeling that would have happened. Yeah, might have been around then. And you first played piano. I understand. Is that right? I and believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and when you were in the the band, was it called the Festival Jazz Ensemble then, or was it still the band? Band, jazz band. The word ensemble wasn't part of the title. Okay. I can't remember the MIT, the MIT jazz band. Oh, the the word festival wasn't in it. I think it became right. festival mm -hmm. when when a second entity sprung up. Right. As and you I'm, mentioned, I'm, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly that date because well, um, even it's, Everett's not sure he, if it's oh. if it's for sixty seven or sixty six. And gee, I couldn't help you on that. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I've seen some other dates that are even make it even more more murky. We're just trying to mm -hmm. see if we can can get that um, out. Um, I'm sure you know there'd be if there's any record. I mean, the, yeah. the performances were a matter of public records, so somebody right. would have 
listed them in, you know, right. the tech or yeah. whatever handouts right. there were. Right. Um, when in my interviews with Herb um, and asking him about his rehearsal technique and stuff, he was um, he took the the rhythm section very seriously and, and did a lot of work with them. And you being the pianist and part of the rhythm section, do you remember the kinds of things that he um, he worked on? You know, either with you specifically or with with the rhythm section in general. Um, that's a very fair question. I'm not sure I can give you a real helpful answer. I don't personally remember, and it took me a long time to realize that. To be perfectly honest, I wasn't nearly the quality of of, uh, of jazz band piano player I thought I was. I vastly overestimated my skills. What I was was an excellent reading piano player, uh, and you know, with a fairly good sense of rhythm. But I really was way uh, under, uh, not up to speed in the real important areas of. Uh, that, that make jazz band piano playing what it is, which is comping and soloing. I mean, that may sound silly to say, but I thought, well, I'm a pianist, I'll play in this group. I played in every other group that needed a piano, why not this group? Uh, and it took me a while to be humble enough to realize that there were, you know, some people around that I should be paying attention to. And I remember, I think at the time I was around, and I was asking Herb about this gentleman, there was a guy named Brage Golding, soft-spoken pianist. Herb would remember the name that Herb thought a lot of and it uh, took me a while to... I was also, I told Herb, I was sort of a smart-ass know-it-all when I came here, like folly of youth or something. It took me a while to get to be humble and be a good listener and just, you know, keep myself out of the equation and just stop and listen and learn. But uh, Herb was raving about Brage Golding and later on I understood why. He was just a tasteful skilled player. I really didn't have good, I was lacking in a lot of jazz skills. That uh, Herb, I, I will say, among other things about Herb, he was, uh, he, he would never kind of go for the jugular and, and cut somebody's ego. I mean, he never came over to me and said, you know, you, you really don't know the first thing about comping. Or he, he would never put anything in a negative way. He would sort of make an illusion you know, let me let me try Brage Golding on some of these pieces, uh, but he would he had uh, he had a, a an an absolute instinct against uh, wounding anybody's ego. He would never lie to anybody, but he be, but he was extremely uh, diplomatic and tactful and considerate. I mean, it's just the way he is as a person. I mean, I could tell you what a superb role model he was, not just as a musician, but as a person. That is that is the main lesson that I have taken from her Pomeroy. And we'll get into some more of that. I have some questions about that, <clears throat> that for you. But um, oh, oh, forgive me, your rhythm question, and again, I don't remember myself being one of these people that could tell you a lot about him paying attention to the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. I knew he needed to have a good rhythm section, and one or two years... He hated to go outside MIT for players. He just didn't feel it was the spirit of the group. And he only did it when he felt, I think the way he put it, when when if I were to not go out of MIT for one player, it would jeopardize the experience of the other 15 or 16. And one year he went out to get a drummer named Harry Blazer, who was wonderful. Uh, it's just, I'm sure you can understand, having not having a, a kind of skilled drummer would just ruin the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know that on certain occasions he would have to make that decision. He made it very reluctantly and only with the greatest uh, amount of care and concern for how people were, were going to feel about it. And again, it wasn't for his ego. It was for making everybody else's experience as worthwhile as possible. And it was, he, that was strictly the way the judgment was made. Wow. So, um, in subsequent years, you played French horn with the FJE. Right. And, um... I think he probably figured out, maybe I should be doing something other than piano. <laughs> I don't know. He saw my enthusiasm. I, I can't remember. I'm being a little facetious. Uh, at some time, I don't know, I guess there was a discussion. I don't know how it came up, but it, it seemed like... Or maybe some of the arrangements that Herb was using 
uh, started to have French horn parts under consideration as a sort of extra member of the trombone mm -hmm. section. Oh, so you, so your role was kind of related to the trombone section. I was going to ask about that. Where? Well, the role of the French of... horn. Um, I mean, I'm not an expert jazz arranger, but typically, the horn goes with trombones very well. It could go with the saxes a little well. It uh, it isn't quite a trumpet sonority. Yeah. It's got such uh, a huge range, so it can in, in different yeah. timbres. Like. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying. Of course it can play with trumpets and so on and so on. But uh, it used to be voiced with the, the trombones, mostly. Although also, I think, remember, actually it was it could be the lead trumpet down an octave. He would just say, this is what you'll play on this piece, if there was no existing French horn part. So I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but by and large, I think when arrangers thought of it, well, it could be lead trumpet down an octave, or it could be with the trombones. And then Herb was telling me that there was a point when, there, when you were joined by a second yes, French Yes, I horn. remember Robert Schmidt, the name Robert yeah. Schmidt. I think the two of us, yeah, it was quite something to have two French horns. <laughs> How, how did that change the the sound of the band? Did it have a big big effect? Well, uh, you'd have to ask someone like Herb, who you know was doing most of the listening. Uh, I'm sure it did, and and uh, uh, sorry, I'm a little incoherent. Uh, just I guess what you'd expect that the mellowness of the French horn would uh, create certain possibilities. Um, I just, I couldn't give you a specific, like it sounded this way before the horns and this way after. Um, gee, I just don't remember. I have to say, you know, bands have survived with French horn, but they've also survived worldwide without French horn. French horn is, I, I would say, still an, aux an auxiliary instrument. I don't think the Count Basie Band. I don't think any of those famous bands ever had French horns. Uh, Thad Jones Mel Lewis band has had French horns. Uh, and the sort of Finnegan band was a whole different thing. It wasn't a standard instrumentation to begin with. But the French horn's auxiliary. Yeah. In New York, uh, he used to be in Boston, a jazz French hornist, Marshall Seeley. Do you run across him? Mm, I don't think I know the name. He used to play with Mark Harvey's um, Artwork Jazz Orchestra, and he would take these amazing solos. I mean, he was a real jazz. Oh. Player, mm -hmm. uh, he took long solos. And Mark featured him in a lot of pieces. Uh -huh. um, and there was a, I don't know if it's any relationship. There was a trumpet player named Nate Seely at MIT, but maybe no relation. Anyway. So, with your time with the FJE, did you get a chance to do any writing or arranging for the band? No, except once. I remember when I was a freshman. This is <laughs> show you about my lack of knowledge and so on. The movie Goldfinger, this is a really silly story, hope you won't mind my telling it, opened yeah. like 1964-65, and I heard the original soundtrack album, and there's about a seven-minute piece of background music called Dawn Raid on Fort Knox, just this music, it doesn't really sound very interesting without the movie, and I transcribed it. Oh, I also played in a Long Island stage band when I was in high school, the last two years stage band of people assembled from around Long Island. And I, I wrote this piece out, took it off the record. I do more transcribing than arranging. I don't, I don't I haven't found a creative voice if I have it, but I like to transcribe. And I wrote this thing out and uh, I brought it up to MIT. I was all excited because maybe the MIT jazz band would play my piece, the piece I wrote out. Not my piece, John Barry's piece. And it was it was a ridiculous idea. It had just endless high notes for the trumpets, but it had this like F chord, and the trumpet had to keep playing written high Ds over and over and over again. And Herb, who was nice enough to read it through, and I vaguely remember he was, he was very solicitous, and he said, you know, you don't think you'd like to swap the parts, give the trumpet player a rest? I said, no, no, there's something, you know, I know it all. And, and, um, and somehow he explained to me that he didn't think this was the right piece for the jazz band to be performing. And uh, I remember I used to laugh about it years later. That's right, Bill Grossman, Dawn Raid on Fort Knox. <laughs> so uh, apart from that transcription effort, I don't think I ever arranged for the jazz fan. <laughs> 
Well, you being quite the um, the conductor and, and an astute observer of other other conductors, um, do you have any comments about um, her Pomeroy as a as a as a conductor? I mean, we don't in, in jazz you don't often talk about a conductor, mm -hmm. but there's a way that he's a conductor. And um, well, I mean, you're opening up a question that that deserves a, you know uh, a long answer. Uh, I mean, as the conductor and you know, music director of the jazz band, he was the inspiration for everybody in that group to to want to play at the level they did and to be able to play at the level they did. He provided the inspiration, the skills, the knowledge uh, in many, many ways. Um, I would have to start with the, the human qualities. He never treated us like we were inferior to the kind of people he expected or was accustomed to working with, uh, namely like his Berkeley students and of course his professional associations. Uh, he never really would say anything to let us know that we didn't play our instruments as well as the guys over at Berkeley. Uh, he was not judgmental in that way. Uh, so first of all, our group started out with incredible self-esteem. Uh, and he, he's probably told you all his anecdotes about he wasn't sure if he should come, and he came, and then he pretended that he had conflicts so he wouldn't have to come to the concerts, and yeah. all those stories about the evolving years. Uh, and some of those I wasn't sure I was a part of. I think he started a year before me, a year or two before the fall of 65. Um, I remember, well, his choice of music. He, he had this whole batch of people that were like a farm team of, of writers of arrangements from Berkeley and eventually some people from MIT, Richie Orr, and maybe some others I can't think of. Uh, he would play anything anybody wrote. He would read it through and maybe put it on a concert. We would definitely give it a read through. So his own taste was exquisite, exquisite. I haven't heard the old records from his old band. They're very famous. I just had not gotten my hands on them. I don't think they've been reissued as CDs yet, unfortunately. But his taste, I mean, everything that came, everything that was put on the stand was uh, exciting, challenging, worthy music. Uh, and different. Uh, it was progressive. I don't think he liked, you know, moldy fig or whatever the word is. He didn't like just kind of anything that sounded like a stock arrangement. It had to be something interesting and fresh and challenging. And uh, so we got great charts, and he would rehearse with great care. And I remember he never faked. Uh, I see in the outside world a lot of conductors who pretend they'll, they'll hear a chord and know whether it's right or wrong. He made sure he knew if it was right or wrong, and he wasn't above going note by note to just double check. He had no vanity. I mean, his ear was fantastic. His ear still is fantastic. But what I'm trying to say is he didn't try to act like a maestro. He was just, it was all about the music. And um, he, uh, it was all, I can't remember when he was ever really wrong about something. And he would also couch things in a non-judgmental way. He'd say like, I think that should be a B natural. If anybody was playing a B flat, they should play a B natural. Instead of saying, what did you play? Did you play B flat? Well, you should have played B natural. That B flat's wrong. Nothing like that. Uh, sort of like some of what happened the other night in the rehearsal uh, last night. The rehearsal I taped. Um, I I do remember sort of anecdotally, and this is maybe getting far afield. We and I told him later we had more fun than I think anybody had a right to have in those rehearsals. And he was one of the people at MIT that. It was a unique combination of having a lot of fun in rehearsals, which a lot of a number of MIT groups, MIT groups did have a lot of fun, and having a very high standard in what he wanted for the performance, which a lot of MIT groups did. But I would say his group had the best of both worlds more than any other group. I don't want to name names, but that was the way I felt about his group. We had fun and we sounded great. Um, Maybe it was owing to the fact that this group was a particularly uh, felicitous kind of group to assemble. You know, the instrumentation may have been what students were good at or whatever. But anyway, it was fun, and we played 
at a level that we were all very proud of and he was proud of. And, you know, we got recognition from the outside world with the festivals, but it was a great source of pride. Um, I'm just trying to make it. Oh, yes. And occasionally, little things would get him upset. I remember little anecdotes or little phrases he would say. He had a way of um, just using like a word to describe when things were not going well. Somebody left all their music at home, or one player forgot to bring his mute, or one player forgot to do this. And, uh, you know, it would be a drag, and he'd say, eh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> with, a, with a nice little sarcastic dry martini twist. Excellent, excellent. And the maddest he would get uh, is he'd say, that, that really burns my ass. That really burns my ass. And then you know he was pretty upset. But it would take a lot for him to get upset. I think missing, missing players in rehearsal, missing bodies, um, was very upsetting. It was upsetting to all of us. Uh, things would happen, you know. There'd be, you know, in an academic world of extracurricular music, people would sometimes, unfortunately, have to make something else a priority. Um, but he was very kind and pleasant about all that. But I was talking with some of my colleagues, alumni, and excellent became a part of our vocabulary. You know, you get to a traffic jam, excellent, excellent. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was, I thought it was great. Um, rehearsing. Oh, I remember he had one tune he called the spit tune. <laughs> and ba doom, ba doom, something. It was the figure in the yeah. tune. Um, I mean, this is sort of anecdotal. I mean, we were having, it was, it was an amazing and unerring combination of fun and hard work. I've, I can't recall anything like it since. I've been in a lot of groups that worked hard, a lot of groups that had fun, but this combined both of them. Um, he worked on intonation. Uh, he drilled principles into us, which I still heard him enunciating the other day. If you have a minor second, play the lower note a little softer than the upper note. If you have a drop off a pitch of a chord, establish the pitch before you drop. If you're going to have an upbeat to a, to a note, one, two, three, four, pa, that you miss, you miss the counting of the one. You have to kind of let that go by. One, two, three, four, pa, two, three, four. So the playing in anticipation, kind of be prepared to lose your awareness of when the next downbeat is, if I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. um, don't try to count. One, two, three, four, and one. One, two, three, four, pa, two, three, four. Um, Things like that, attention to longs and shorts, articulations, um, just going back and forth from the big picture to the small picture. You know, it wasn't Herb that said God is in the details, but he embodied it. Um, I don't know, have I, no, that's, is that that's, enough that's, of an answer? That's, that's really good. That's just, you know, um, sort of my feeling my way around this subject. I mean, he was, I think... I, I, I would be surprised if, if you spoke to anybody that played for any length of time in that band that Herb was not a role model for the rest of their life. Just, it was incredible, incredible. Anyway. So what are some of the things that, that um, <clears throat> lasting kind of musical values of, that you've taken from him that you, you, you feel like in your working life as a musician today? Well, some of them are not that easy to translate. The working world is a little tougher than the world at MIT in some ways. Um, uh, the atmosphere that Herb created in rehearsals is not always, I have not, I should say, I have not always found it easy to see that replicated in the quote professional world. It can be very business-like and uh, people play to earn an income and that is sometimes what matters to them. It's their right. Uh, but you can't expect people to fall in love with everything they do professionally. Uh, I'm sort of generalizing, but that, that's the point I would make. Um, respect for people and just kind of learning what you're going to do. Learning, knowing what you're going to do. If you're going to be a conductor, learn how to use your ears and hear the difference between a minor seventh chord and a major seventh chord. Uh, Know when somebody gets lost. Know when the rhythm's wrong. Uh, I think, although Herb didn't say it explicitly, I think the most important asset somebody can have <coughs> next to the technique of playing their instrument is great ears. It took me lo far longer than I feel proud about to learn that. Without great ears, you're nobody. Uh, 
and um, let me see uh, the professional world I don't know I my ears I would say got better and better every year in my life they I think continue and uh, I don't know if Herb started that I and no one no one really came to me and said, improve your ears, improve your ears. You know, the more, the more your ears work well, the better a musician you'll be. But I kind of figured out that somehow myself. I wish somebody had told me when I was about seven. It would have saved a lot of time. Uh, so, hmm, I'm mean, just trying to think. Well, just, uh, and, and he cared about people... Uh, a lot. I mean, I think he's even interviewed. I think he, he he puts the people at at are at least as important as the music, or maybe even more important for him sometimes if he verbalizes it. And it's a good thought. It's it's sometimes hard to put into practice. There are some musicians who'll eat you alive if you come on like a sort of nice guy. It it all depends on the circumstance. Uh, I guess I would say I've learned to try and be nice to people, as a, as a starting point. And you know, slow to anger, uh, and try to be sympathetic. There have been times when I've worked with just unpleasant people, and uh, it wasn't necessarily personal. They just somehow did not like doing what they were doing. They didn't like doing it with me, and uh, not too much I could do about it except weather the storm and move on to the next project. But to try and try and radiate a little humanity and not not fake. Not, not fake. That was Herb never faked in his life. Uh, uh, don't pretend you know something when you don't. And that may sound elementary, but I see lots of faking in the musical world. And uh, it'd be a better world if it weren't there. Wow. What a, what a great experience you had working with him and the legacy he's left for so many people is, is fantastic. Um, I'd like to talk some more about um, your involvement in other um, MIT musical groups. Um, did you play, um, how much did you play with the MIT concert band with John Corley? I played a lot. <laughs> I joined the concert band in 1965. And let me just double back and say, I was very depressed as an MIT freshman. They had, I don't know if they still have it, but Rush Week was the first thing you did when you got to MIT. Yeah. And, uh, I hold the MIT, uh, the, P, the powers that be, in absolute contempt. This is no way to treat a person new to the college experience. It was awful. Yeah. You were plunked down at an airport. Some guy from Pi Lam picked you up in a car, and you then had a week of rejection in front of you. It was awful. I don't know. I, they were working on changing that. Well, I, uh, it was MIT yeah. being selfish. They didn't want to have to house people for their freshman year if they could avoid it. Uh, I would have to say just as an overall arching thing, my experiences with people like Herb and John Corley and the other people that I've worked with were in contradistinction, is that the right word? In contrast to the overall absolute lack of concern for people as human beings that I found pervasive at this school. I'm very sorry to have to say. Uh, and music was my salvation. I remember walking the hall near this library, from between Building 10 and the you know the, the glass enclosed wing, I was just depressed. And I found the activities cage, the Rockwell. I, it's probably not still there. They used to have an activities midway at Rockwell Cage, one of the first things of freshman year. And I saw all these excited people, and they were playing Gilbert and Sullivan. And I became a member. I I, I found music as a sort of salvation, starting with the Rockwell, with the activities midway at the Rockwell Cage early first week of my freshman year or something. Uh, concert band, I joined in 65. I joined every group I could be in. I just was attracted to music, you know, like a filing to iron magnet or whatever it is, iron filing to a magnet. Uh, I was in the band until I left Boston in 73, uh, 70, spring of 74, and actually returned once or twice for some, you know, projects came along with John Corley and John Bavicki on a tour once, conducted that little piece that you have there, the, what is it called, Festive Prelude, uh, that I wrote for a commencement, I think in 19, there was a commencement that I wasn't in, which was my graduating class's year, 69, uh, and I wrote that for John's brass group, and another piece for 
1971, or maybe two more pieces. Anyway, uh, so I was in the concert band from fall of 65 till 74 actively with return visits up until uh, well, I was an audience member and participant <coughs> in, I think, his last concert. I don't know if that was one of the concerts where alumni were invited to sit in. Yeah. And I, I was sitting in. I was uh, at that concert, yeah. Maybe it was a prelude and happy dance. I can't remember what, or maybe John Bavicki's suite for band, whatever the piece was. So spanning, I guess, about 30 years, maybe more, over 30 years, most of the activity between 65 and 74. And you always played French horn with that group? No. I think I started on French horn, and they heard that I could play piano, so they handed me some mallets. I said, go play in the percussion <laughs> section. We need some mallet players. You know, you can read a keyboard. <laughs> it was that, that, that quick. Wow. Uh, you know, as things happen in the musical world, amateur, you know, educational high school, people go where there's a, you know, where there's a vacancy. They needed, they needed percussion players. And that thinking on your feet has really helped you professionally, it looks like. Well, a little bit. I, I mean, I never passed myself off. I did earn a living on a couple jobs where I played some percussion, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it now. I mean, I wasn't really a, a great percussionist. I was, I was sort of okay. <laughs> well, um, if there's time, we can get back to. Um, well, let me before we leave John Corley and the concert band. Um, um, he was just an incredible person and, and conductor and musician in so many ways. Um, it's an unfair question to kind of throw this at you, but just um, talk about John Corley a little bit. Um, sure, um, I'd be happy to. Uh, John was also kind of a person who would inspire people, not just conduct the rehearsals of the concert. Uh, people gravitated towards the band and the year I came to MIT was, was a year after he was also the conductor of the orchestra. He'd been conductor of both for many years. So the, the history of the orchestra predates my time. Uh, but he had admirers in a way that Herb did. People, people loved working with John. Uh, I got to work with him once. He guest conducted the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra. I remember he did Stravinsky's Symphony in Three Movements and I think Brahms Four, some other things, and I played bass drum or something. Stravinsky Symphony in Three Movements and hung out at various things he did. I would go play in Brookline. He had, we did like little runouts of chamber music to Brookline and things like that. Uh, so John, it was just very exciting and he wanted people to understand the emotions of the music. It wasn't just about the correct execution of what was on the page. That mattered to him too, but he wanted, especially what he wanted to get across was the emotion of the piece, and uh, um, I remember he would sing the opening of the Beversdorf Symphony, Thomas Beversdorf, he would put words to it. Um, oh, I can't remember, you know, verbalizing things about music. Um, he would do things, the Vittorio Giannini, oh, I think it was called Prelude and Fugue, or Prelude and Allegro, and it used to have a big loud ending and he, he thought it deserved a smaller ending and he made a sort of retouch and had a diminuendo with a suspended cymbal roll instead of a big fortissimo cymbal crash. Uh, I mean, I'm just sketching the outlines, but... And I got to learn that he was very knowledgeable about the years of the Boston Symphony under Kuzovitsky, which were great years from my awareness of them. I don't know a lot of Kuzovitsky recordings. But Kuzovitsky was all about the emotion of the music and getting it out of the orchestra. Um, uh, and John, I think, absorbed some of that. I think he studied with George Magere, who was the first trumpet of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And I remember John saying at one point he had to make a decision in his life. Was he going to be a Tanglewood Fellow or was he going to go to music education? And I think he opted for music education. It was like a crossroads one summer. And he stayed in the music education field. But he would have been a he would have been a first class professional full time professional trumpet player if he had pursued it, and he continued to play lots of freelance trumpet in the Boston area, as I recall. Uh, anyway, what else about John? Um, 
Oh yeah, a band that did no transcriptions. Very hip, right. very hip. Uh, and amazing, I mean, this is not a music school. Every band in the world does these dumb transcriptions of the Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony and the Shostakovich Fifth and so on and so on. Not for John. Great, what a great idea. But the band, the band isn't a poor stepchild of the orchestra with clarinets playing the string parts. He also got pieces, uh, the band played a lot of new pieces. He had a lot of connections, <coughs> excuse me, to Boston composers, uh, Bill Maloof, damn it, uh, mm, Eve of St. Agnes, Ed, oh damn, um, I'm drawing a blank on some of the names. Uh, and Gregory Tucker for MIT, um, Andrew Kasdan, yeah. very important name. Also an and, MIT graduate. Yes, yeah. Sloan School and New England Conservatory. Right. I met Andrew Kasdan, I don't know him well, but we've met and corresponded once or twice, and Andy wrote a lot for the band, and Andy was, I think, very close to John. Uh, Andy, I think, also wrote a bunch of tech shows, maybe, too, in the 50s. Right. Not, not sure about that. Uh, so John encouraged, I remember, I remember I think Christmas of 65, I never did it, but I said, I'm going to go home and write a piece for the band. And John was just so excited, he told the whole band, and here's Bill Grossman who's going to go home and write a piece for us. Uh, I mean, I think the best I could do was I wrote a piece for brass and percussion that the band played on one of their tours. Uh, I think I made an abortive start of writing a piece for the band, but I never could quite do it. I'm not quite that creative. Um... We had fun on tours, went on a lot of tours. I think the touring got cut down. I don't know if, I don't know the numbers. I have this feeling that the MIT music department or somebody cut back their support and, and the tours got cut back in scope. Um, um, let me think. John Bavicki, John Bavicki got to meet John Corley. I remember I asked them how they met and John Bavicki said he, saw John Corley playing like at one of the theaters in the pit and he leaned over and says, why don't you guys, I hear you have a brass group, why don't you play some of my music? <laughs> sort of a brash, something like a brash introduction by a composer and Corley said, okay, I'll take a look at it. And Bavicki wrote one piece after another for the MIT band. The year I came was the year they premiered, I think it was called Festival Symphony, it had antiphonal trumpets. <coughs> um, and it was, it was a great piece. I don't know if it was ever recorded. I mean, probably concerts were taped. Great, great piece. And I also played the Suite for Band. I can't remember all the other pieces. So the repertoire was very interesting. And I remember John always wanted to have pieces that were a little harder than everybody could play. He wanted to challenge people. And uh, he did. I remember Vivicki's music had these amazing scales but not a scale like you've ever seen. It wasn't a major scale, it was a minor scale, it was like probably some, it might be classified as a jazz scale with alterations or some, but he had these amazing scales that were the basis of a lot of his music and terrific, exciting, well-calculated harmonies, very rich music. Um, so the repertoire, we had a, we had, we had a lot of fun. Um, I wish I could remember some of the jokes he would tell, but he, he, we had a good time there. John took on a lot of other activities. I remember a friend of mine who's up in, who lives up in the Boston area named Charlie Kiefer helped to organize a reading of West Side Story, a performance, concert performance one night and one summer, and John agreed to conduct it. And it didn't occur to me until years later, John Corley probably did so many things without ever asking for pay from people. He would do extra things for MIT students, when he orchestrated the tech shows, he got, I th it's a pitiful amount of money, I think, for his work in 1968, he got a total of like $300, which even in 1968 dollars was very little. Herb orchestrated one number of the tech show in 1968, uh, and John did all the rest. Um, I think for time reasons, you know, orchestrations, the pieces get need to be orchestrated at the last minute, so some of the work gets formed down. And John, money was never discussed. I mean, it took me years to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, John was being too nice to us. I mean, music is how he makes his living. Why was he so nice to us? It just was his nature. He gave and gave and gave. Uh, he would never say no. 
to a project if he if he thought it would be helpful to us. It was also through John that I met the first professional level player that I knew, Boston Symphony player named Felix Vesculia, used to be the bass clarinetist of the Boston Symphony prior to the current clarin bass clarinetist. And I got to know Phil and learn a little bit about what it's really like, you know, demyth, taking the mythology out of what it's like to be a professional working musician. And some of those thoughts I kept in my head for years. Remember I asked Phil about the Boston Pops, what's it like to play in the Boston Pops? And he said, it's a drag, but it's a well-paying drag. He was very honest. He, he didn't, he, he was not, he was the kind of person that would give you a, you know, it wasn't a cynical answer, it was, it was an honest answer. I mean, it, it, I realized that Boston Pops is not what these people went into music to do, but it's what the Boston Symphony needed to keep its books balanced. And uh, I remember talking with Phil about different things. I remember telling him Armando Gatala sounded great in the Bach Brandenburg, that's the one with the trumpet solo. And I said, oh, he sounded great. And Phil said, yeah, well, yeah, if he doesn't, he gets fired. Uh, just little, little ideas of introduction. And I had the, once the temerity, I think Leinsdorf was doing Petrushka, a series of concerts. I used to go to the BSO a lot the last couple undergrad years. I started the habit of going in my junior year. We'd go to the Friday rush hour concerts. And I heard a couple performances of the same piece sometimes. And I, I said to Phil, rather untactfully, I said, gee, that performance tonight wasn't as good as the night before. What happened? The other night was really good. And he said in a very nice way, he said, you can't expect perfection out of a performance. That, that, that's rare. You understand when it happens, but you, know, you don't have the right to expect that. It doesn't happen every night that the orchestra gets together. And uh, he also, I was kind of lucky in a way that these people didn't chew my head off of some of the really <laughs> uh, direct questions I would ask, or you know, presumptuous questions. They were all very nice. And John knew a lot of people from the working world of music around Boston. Will Traphagen was a tuba player. I remember he was around from time to time. Um, I remember I used to go with John to some, some of his outside work. I remember watching, he, he would come and watch ballet dancers before he'd conduct the Boston Ballet and a whole bunch of various things. But he, he kind of, I was always welcome to go watch whatever it was he was doing. He was very nice to me and uh, sought, you know, kind of encouraged me to write, and I wrote a couple pieces for the commencement. And he took them around, he had a brass choir, I think it was called the Boston Brass or something like that. Right. And he would play at a lot of commencements, and he played my music over and over again. And of course, to be honest, I never asked him for money, money I wouldn't have dared. It was not, not the point, absolutely not the point. Wow. I hope at some point to get, um, do an interview with you, we can get in more detail about your work with, with um, John Corley. Did you play with the MIT Orchestra at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, my freshman year was, as it was, as it were, David Epstein's freshman year. I remember the fall of 65, a bunch of freshmen were invited all over to the Delt House. I think it's, it was down Mem Drive toward Burton House. It was this sort of fancy fraternity house. And we were introduced to David Epstein, the new professor of music. And Klaus gave this distinguished introduction to David Epstein and then he got up to speak and out comes this guy with a kind of rich New York Brooklyn accent. Well, great, great, to, I can't imitate him, but he, you know, he, he didn't sound elitist at all. He sounded like a very interesting guy and I got to play in the orchestra. I would have to say, uh, and this is not controversial, but it's just a fact of the MIT life, there were a number of people I learned later that were upset that John Corley was let go as the orchestra conductor. So David Epstein's first year was an orchestra practically made up of freshmen. There were people who did not, who boycotted the orchestra. It was not that they had anything against David Epstein. They, they were upset that John Corley was uh, let go. That's the truth. It's an unpleasant truth. And um, I'm not aware enough of what the goings-on with the orchestra were, or the issues, and uh, but it was very touchy. But anyway, at the time I played in the orchestra, uh, I think I started out playing French horn, eventually played percussion. I may have played some piano parts now and then. Um, I remember I played timpani. The orchestra went to uh, 
Carnegie Hall, John Buttrick played the uh, Emperor Concerto, and I played timpani, which has a duet with the piano at yeah. the end. And uh, I also played L'Histoire, percussion under David Epstein. I kind of recruited him. And I remember once, speaking of players, we needed a bass player. We really didn't have a bass player to do L'Histoire. And I found this young guy at New England Conservatory to come play bass for us. And that young guy is Lawrence Wolf, Larry Wolf, who's now the assistant principal bass of the Boston Symphony <laughs> and principal bass of the Boston Pops. It's around 1969. The shy, unassuming guy who played his ass off. Wow. Anyway, interesting story. Wow, wow. Um, I haven't, unfortunately, didn't get a chance to um, to interview um, David Epstein. I had oh. an interview scheduled with him, but it was a week oh. before he died that he oh. called me and told me that um, he was in the hospital. And, uh, you um, might try talking to his widow, Anne. Yeah. Maybe she might shed some light. So I certainly want to be um, interviewing people who played under him. And mm -hmm. um, and I um, don't have MIT orchestra questions prepared, yeah. um, but let me just throw out a, a general question. You've talked about some of the repertoire you did with him. Talk about um, him as a conductor. About who? John, or, um, David Epstein. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, I will be blunt and say John Coley was a little more fun. And David Epstein may have been a little more demanding. That's to generalize. Uh, having said that, David was, uh, set a very high standard for the MIT Orchestra and took great pride in getting the orchestra to play at a very high level. Um, it was very serious and the tone was a little different. Some of us, I think, felt maybe we were a little spoiled by, by not quite having as much fun as at some of the other groups. And I don't fault David for that, I'm just drawing a distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I, I didn't realize it consciously, but poor David Epstein had this burden of he had three classes of students that, that, that hated his orchestra. It was, it was, it's tough going. I mean, it happens in the world of academia. People take over for a beloved person and, uh, and, and there's resentment. And I, I mean, he never talked about it to me, never talked about it. He, he alluded to it with some other people. So I wouldn't begrudge him if he felt a little bit out of sorts about some of the uh, mood of MIT. It took, of course, in years, you know, things smooth out as they do. Um, but I remember he took the orchestra very seriously. Uh, and um, he would kind of boast a little, overboast, sort of like, we can do things the Boston Symphony can't because we have time to go into depth and rehearsal. <clears throat> and I sort of thought, I don't know, I think he was saying it to kind of make everybody feel like really excited about the orchestra, but it was sometimes a little over the top. But having said that, he did great repertoire, great repertoire. We did Schoenberg music for an imaginary film scene. We did Roberto Gerhard dances from Don Quixote. We did a piece called Ventures <coughs> by David Epstein. I think it's V-E-N-T-U-R-E-S, a play on the word winds. It was a piece for winds right. written for the Eastman School. Uh, Charles Ives' Third Symphony in my freshman year, Walter Piston, one of the suites. Uh, and uh, David Epstein turned out a lot of recordings. I don't think, I think they were after my time. Incredible amount of recordings for, uh, was it the Desto label or something? I forget the label. Uh, that are still around as, uh, some of them may have become CDs. Yeah, some of them have been really uh, issued. Uh, Walter Piston, Incredible Flutist, Aaron Copeland, Dance Symphony. I mean, I, I can't remember them all, but, I mean, he really uh, made the orchestra a very uh, active and uh, vital part of music making in, you know, the world at large. People knew about it in Boston and through the recordings, you know, people got to hear the MIT orchestra play uh, important repertoire that, that had been neglected by other companies, which is a great thing to do. It's the sort of thing Jerry Schwartz, Gerard Schwartz does with the Seattle Symphony, recording all these neglected American works. It's a terrific idea. The world does not need more Beethoven Symphony recordings. God knows. Yeah. Not really. Not even with Roger Norrington around. Um, trying to remember more about David Epstein. 
yeah, he did. He did L'Histoire. We had a great time, and uh, he was he was a wonderful teacher of theory, and he did relate it in some way to his thinking about conducting, particularly in relationship to tempos and motive, motivic uh, unity within music, and tempo relationships within music. The two books he wrote, the articles, um, and. Uh, so that was very, very interesting, his form and analysis uh, class. I also remember I did a, I, I sent in a small submission to the Conductors Guild. They printed articles, tributes after he passed away. And I remember the day after Martin Luther King died, or the class, whatever the class was after Martin Luther King died, uh, David Epstein took that class and he talked about Martin Luther King. He didn't talk about whatever was assigned that day. It was just too important to talk about Martin Luther King and what this meant. And I'll never never forget it. I mean, I've said it in other venues. And I still remember other MIT classes, some Professor Arthur Evans, you know, double E. And we went to our class on computer science and the PAL language or whatever the hell we were doing. And it was just, okay, the next lecture. And I thought, this is a disgrace. David Epstein was a mensch. And a mensch in a community of non-menches. I mean, for him to have done that, that, that was one thing he did. And I'm sure it, blends, it bleeds into how he must have felt about music. But it just, that, I'll never forget that. Never forget that. That, that, were, that he wanted us to understand the world we're living in. This is not an ivory tower where you just shut out the world and go on to your assignment of the day, and he talked about Martin Luther King that day, and it was, uh, it was great, it was uh, wonderful. So you got your start as a conductor and getting some basic conducting skills while at MIT? More or less, uh, like a lot of other kids, I got to stand up in front of my high school band or orchestra, but I'm pretty sure I didn't know what I was doing. I may have known the beat patterns, but I didn't know really what I was doing. Uh, I got opportunities. Actually, I came here my freshman year, and I was this wonderful rehearsal pianist. I, I had a good facility for it from hearing musicals when I was in high school and all. Um, and at that time, there was no musical theater guild. There was the Gilbert and Sullivan Society. Fall of 65, they did Yeoman of the Guard, directed by Stephen Gilborn, G-I-L-B-O-R-N, who now uh, is a working actor. He's been in a lot of... Um, uh, the Practice, I think he's been an attorney on the show, The Practice on TV, and a bunch of credits. Anyway, he was the director, Mickey Rainier was the uh, uh, conductor, and everybody thought I was this great rehearsal pianist, and I must have opened my mouth and said, I want to conduct, I want to conduct, and I got to conduct, it was unheard of. The second half of my freshman year, I got to conduct the Gilbert and Sullivan show. It was Pirates of Penzance. That was the good news. The bad news is, nobody wanted to play in my orchestra. <laughs> The orchestra was sort of word of mouth. If they heard the conductor, oh, Mickey Rainier's conducting, we're going to sign. You know, it was all for love. No, nobody paid. Nobody got paid. But you could get together great amateur orchestras. I did later when I, become, when I became better known and better skilled. But uh, they were almost going to do the show without an orchestra. My little group sounded so bad. I mean, they were breaking my heart. I was breaking their heart. They, they listened to this orchestra that had been assembled, and I, I probably wasn't doing too much damage, but I wasn't doing a whole lot of good either. But uh, I had to beg and beg and beg just to get warm bodies to play. Years later, uh, I got to do a lot more of it. I think one of the guys who got to play in my orchestra immediately started conducting on his own, a talented, ambitious guy named Steven Weinberg. He was a clarinetist. I think that's his name. He, uh, he even he conducted the Gilbert and Sullivan group, and he did a concert with them, unheard of. He did, like, Quiet City years ago in, like, the solid of Puerto Rico. Talented, ambitious guy. And uh, But years later, I got to do more. Somehow, I got back into conducting. I had this disgraceful, you know, like, fall from grace, like Icarus that goes <laughs> too far to the sky, and bam, I crashed down. I didn't conduct for a couple of years. Then I started doing some shows. And I had wonderful productions that were actually springboards to New York. I did company at MIT in 71. I have a reel-to-reel -reel tape of it somewhere. And Sondheim came and listened to it and uh, remembered my name enough that when I met him in New York, it was, a, you know, I wasn't a total stranger. 
did company at MIT, did Mano La Mancha, did a funny thing happen on the way to the forum, did Charlie Brown, one freshman year for freshman orientation in a little theater. Oh, gosh. And a lot of conducting. I don't think I... David Epstein almost had me guest conduct the orchestra once, but it, it, would, it would have been a Sanson cello concerto. And I think he was worried that he didn't... He wanted to serve the soloist well, and it wouldn't be fair to have a, you know, a kind of a starting out soloist and a starting out conductor. It wouldn't be fair. So he, t he did the piece himself. I think he had me do a sectional once of Mahler 5. Um, but I did a fair number of things for the band conducting wise John let me do some conducting and we, we split a lot of conducting one or two years when he wasn't feeling well on tour he was very nice about letting me do it I, I probably did more of it than I should have because I definitely didn't give people the experience that they would have had with John up on the podium you know mostly I mean I was I was competent but John was special I wasn't special <laughs> Wow. Unfortunately, we're soon running out of time. I want to give you a, a chance, just kind of give a you know a parting shot about your your, your time at MIT and um, just any thoughts, stuff that we might not have have covered in just a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. And I yeah. have somebody else coming for an interview. Right. Three. Okay. Well, as I said before, not to dwell on the negative, but MIT was a downer for me my freshman year, my freshman first couple of weeks. And music was my salvation. I remember the walk across Mass Ave to Kresge Auditorium uh, or the student center where rehearsals. I would spend usually at 5 in the afternoon a rehearsal. There'd be a 5 to 6.30 rehearsal, then a little bit of dinner. Then there'd be a 7.30 to 10 rehearsal of the Musical Theater Guild or something. And uh, I started writing the tech show. I actually stopped going to a lot of classes after my... Uh, the, after three terms, uh, second half of my sophomore year, I stopped going to a lot of classes. I did well in the school, but amazingly enough, I didn't go to the classes, just learned the stuff out of books. Uh, I immersed myself in music. It, it was a great joy, and it kept me sane here. I, I, if somehow somebody said there's no more music at MIT, I think ultimately I would have transferred out. I just couldn't take it here anymore. I didn't like the atmosphere. I... Uh, there are too many nerds here for my taste. I mean, I was probably in danger of becoming a nerd. I felt the place should have been more of a place of, of grow, growth as a human being. I still remember this pathetic sight of going up to the fifth floor of the student center, which was a library with little study carols, and people would have fallen asleep on top of their problem sets at 2 in the morning. And <clears throat> maybe it was well and good. I mean, people got a good education out of MIT, but this is not... Uh, uh, preparation for becoming a more adult, function, a functioning adult, and a more humane, uh, humanistic adult. Uh, I missed any humanistic element of MIT except for music. Um, and I got to flex my wings. I was, if you will, a big fish in a small pond. I remember going down to Harvard. Every dorm there had their own, every house had their own orchestra. It was scary. Like every other student at Harvard was a musician. MIT, it wasn't quite that broad a base so anybody that wanted to do music got to do it I was very grateful for that opportunity I would have gotten lost at a bigger school with a lot more competition so um, the MIT music experience was a lot of fun uh, apart, apart from that I love the linguistics the linguistics department at MIT was wonderful and some special courses David Epstein's course and, but it's few and far between except for the linguistics department they were a whole lot of fun a bunch of crazy left-wingers. God forbid if you were a Republican in the linguistics department. Uh, so that's Did you study it. with Jay Kaiser? No, never no. studied with him. No. Didn't really know him. Uh -huh. wow. Well, we've just touched the, the tip of an iceberg with you, and I would like to um, at some time have you come back if you're you know, at, at MIT or mm -hmm. in the area, um, talk about um, more of your work with uh, the tech shows and um, there's just there, there's so much, and then of course your 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 work as a as a conductor in New York, and there, there's so much to talk about. I wish we hadn't run out of time here, <laughs> but um, right. I want to thank you very much for your 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 generosity and. Um, I hope I didn't get off topic too much. This was this <laughs> was really really good. I, um, I I assure you. So so thank okay. you. My uh, pleasure. My pleasure. Okay.